Let's do it. Yeah. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Now that's a very interesting story. All the people that were working for Main Man were unusual. We were loud, ugly Americans, basically. Hello and welcome. This is episode 28 in our series exploring the history of the management rights company Main Man, which was renowned in the 70s for transforming the business side of rock and roll. While allowing Main Man artists to explore their creative freedom, the company pioneered promotion and marketing techniques that became synonymous with the decadence, extravagances and indulgences that are now part of rock folklore. Not a boy, not a girl, just me, Jackie. So this is the forefront of a sexual revolution and the beginnings of an idea of gender fluidity and pansexuality and all sorts of things. So some days Jackie was a boy, some days Jackie was a girl. You know, kind of never knew what Jackie was going to be. Jackie said to me, uh, <laughs> she didn't want that. We called Jackie she, even though she was a boy. But she didn't want them to say, who is Jackie Curtis? She wanted them to say, what was Jackie Curtis? Main Man worked with a very diverse range of clients that included people like Bick Ronson, Amanda Lear, John Mellencamp, Mott the Hoople, Dana Gillespie, Mick Ralphs, Iggy Pop, Cindy Bullens, David Bowie and Lou Reed. They came in a pair. I thought it was great the way they worked together. They were part of a band, same thing I liked. The LGBT plus community in the UK is celebrating people in all their rich diversity by raising awareness of and combating prejudices against the LGBT plus community with a month of activities by individuals or groups embracing LGBT plus history. Five decades ago, David Bowie became the figurehead for a generation of people campaigning for the freedom to celebrate their own self-actualization, redefining sexuality in the 70s. Bowie was not an activist in the traditional sense, but he helped give voice to disenfranchised subcultures in society. And when he stepped onto the stage as Ziggy Stardust in 1972, one of the world's greatest gay icons was born, and the rule books were forever rewritten. In this episode, Main Man's founder Tony DeFries recalls the Main Man ethos of inclusiveness and how David became such a powerful force for the LGBT plus campaigners and prepared for Ziggy Stardust to take on America with the help of some of the world's LGBT plus icons. What we did at Main Man when we began to prepare America for an invasion of Bowie, and we prepared carefully for that because it was clearly going to be a shock to American audiences, much the way it had been a shock to English audiences. But there was already a base of Bowie fans, Bowie press fans, Bowie radio fans, promotional fans, and real Bowie fans, real kids in real places that wanted to be part of this exciting new idea, but hadn't seen the shows and had only heard the music. And what we needed was to get the same sort of enthusiasm and excitement from our American audiences that we had secured in the UK. And to do this, having a very broadly based group of people in the team, and remember when we started working towards this promotion of Bowie in the States, we didn't have David there to perform live. My determination and decision was to create the audience before we sought to do performances. This meant RCA had to be willing and they were persuaded to spend money on radio promotions, advertising, press, bringing, for example, American press to see David perform in the UK and go back and report on it, which was very successful, bringing the idea of Bowie to America before he arrived, creating some kind of a mythology about this new performer and this music before he arrived. And when we did bring David to America, we brought a large number of his US 
backup, if you like, backup team, but not just his band, not just the Spiders from Mars, but also sound engineers who were familiar with his program, with his songs. We brought people who'd worked in the lighting space who were familiar with his stage performance and with his set lists. People, for example, like Robin Mayhew, who had operated his own company, which we helped him start, Ground Control. And that Ground Control became part of the main man group of people that David worked with. So Pete, uh, Robin and uh, Willie Palin and Pete Hunsley, for example, came on the US states to begin with. Later, or we added people like Bob C, C Factor, the Clare brothers who provided equipment and other American-based companies. But because we wanted to be able to present David in a unique way, we brought along people, even including an entourage, unusual for the day, people like Jeff McCormack, who was his long-time friend, minicab driver, made a great cup of tea, helped write some of David's songs, uh, notably When You Rock and Roll With Me. It's a great song out of Diamond Dogs. But most importantly was, like George Underwood, who we also brought originally, people that David had been at school with, at art school with, or primary school with, or middle school with, who he'd stayed friends with, who, in George's case, had done illustration work for David and then for us. In Jeff's case, who'd been there just as a friend companion, had done the Trans-Siberian Railroad trip, believe it or not, through Russia with David and taken some marvellous pictures. You see pictures of David in Moscow, which is quite astonishing. Pictures of Russian kids wondering, what the hell is this? They're looking at, not knowing what it is, but still being entranced by it. Of course, wearing Freddy's costumes and being Bowie. All these people, and many others, Mick Rock again, for example, came on the first Bowie tour, went on the first Bowie bus, and went to Cleveland and all the other cities in America, and were there so that David had a cocoon, a bubble, in which he could travel, in which he was protected, in which he was important. We took the bodyguards from... Initially, we took uh, Stewie and Tony Frost as bodyguards. We got a front-page Rolling Stone out of taking a English black and English white bodyguard in judo, outfits, judo suits, to a Bowie concert, encouraging Rolling Stone to ask, flanking David, of course, why does this man need two bodyguards? And it was a very good question, because at that point in time, almost nobody in America knew who David was. That was a wake-up call to, why does he need two bodyguards? Well, the answer is, later on, people would um, attempt to shoot David, so... Panic in Detroit is a reminder of that. So, of course, he did need bodyguards. And as the very sad and tragic death of John Lennon showed, ultimately, anyone who achieves fame becomes a target. And whether the target is for good or bad, it's still a target. And Dylan experienced it, David experienced it, and John Lennon, unfortunately, experienced it fatally. It was a common occurrence, especially in America. People tended to be expressive and had guns. That's not a good combination. So yes, we, we were right to protect him, but it was also a useful thing to do to protect somebody who was unknown and thereby help people to realize that he was going to be famous and he was going to need to be protected. So we ultimately provided this round of people, and amongst them were the main man staff, who were entirely by gender, by ethnicity, pretty much by everything. They were skilled and unskilled. They were 
dancers and non-dancers. They were gay and straight. They were American and Puerto Rican and African American. They were black. They were white. They were English. They were a large melting pot of different people who worked well together and ultimately all had one aim, which is initially was let's make David famous. A very simple objective to be deployed in any way possible, usually under my control and my direction, and which succeeded in a very short space of time. From 1972 to 1974, David went from being an obscure English singer-songwriter to a global superstar. Not a bad trick, if you can pull it off. We did. And so hats off to the main man staff, many of whom no longer with us for different reasons. And the ones who still remain, they did a great job. And they mostly recall when you get them to talk about it or when you listen to them talking about it, what a wonderful time we had. And we did. We had the best of times, the most astonishing of times, albeit sometimes the worst of times, but a wonderful experience and one that people remember. If you were there, if you were part of it, if you were on that bus, on that tour, at that performance, if you were front of stage doing sound or back of stage doing lights, whatever your part was, if you were just me watching everybody watching everything, walking around every arena, checking audiences, making sure that somebody told the fans where David would be staying so we could have a stampede of press and people rushing to find him, even before he was famous enough to find. All of those were moments of wonder, a golden time. It's important to remember that David's first visit to America was a sponsored promotional trip when he was still on Mercury Records and not long after his last album for Mercury and in many ways his first album for me, Man Who Sold the World, came out. In order to promote that album but without involving live performances which would have required David to be not a headliner, but on a bell or with other bands, and or would have required him to play venues that were not adapted to what he would like to do as a performance. It wasn't, therefore, any way for David to start performing in America, but it was a way for him to meet radio folk, meet journalists, and begin to create some kind of following for that particular record. The trip itself didn't produce those kind of results. What it did produce was, for David, an opportunity to see America firsthand. And seeing America by going there and going from city to city and meeting people who are not part of your normal life experience can make for an enormous uh, difference in the way you see things and perceive things. In David's case, it was very inspirational because it was very, very much a new experience compared to all that he'd experienced in England and a lot more vital in many ways, a lot more exciting. Also, in some cases, more threatening. But it also allowed him to meet people like the Velvet Underground. And that came about because of the promotion folk that he was working with at Mercury, included on the one side, Ron Oberman, who was promoting, doing press and radio probably for Mercury, and whose brother was a music journalist. And between them, Michael and Ron Oberman, Both took different turns at being music journalists or working for record companies in the PR space. And that provided David with an opportunity to meet 
radio station hosts, but also to meet performers that he might not otherwise have met and to hear music that he certainly would not otherwise have heard. So on that trip, he met Doug Yule of the Velvet Underground. He thought he was meeting Lou Reed, but in fact it wasn't Lou Reed, it was Doug. But it did give David, who was already a fan of Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground, an opportunity to then invite Lou Reed to come and do a concert with him in London later on. And that was a very successful concert for David and actually for Lou Reed and led to us making a solo album, which was Lou Reed's first solo album. And that was an album called Transformer. And there was a marvellous song on that called Walk on the Wild Side. And that also opened up an entirely new career for Lou, who became a main man artist and who we supported in that development and went on to have a full solo career with a lot of very significant albums. Now, at the same time, the people that David met included acolytes of the Andy Warhol factory and people who were writing for music magazines, some of them high-end, what I'd call high-end, like the Rolling Stone, others much more of the teeny bop of variety, like 16 or teen magazine. Now, out of this, we have a collection of people that become Bowie followers or Bowie fans in some form. And amongst those are people who later became members of the main man entourage and the main man staff and the main man team. And these include, of course, Tony Zanetta or Z, Jamie Andrews, Lee Childers, who was working for, I think, 16 magazine at the time, Cherry Vanilla, who was in Pork, as were Jamie and Zanetta, and Tony Ingrassia, who wrote the play and directed the play Pork, which was a story about Andy Warhol and a girl called Bridget, who was his sometime protégé, and about all kinds of other people in New York who were featured in that play. Um, that play came to England, performed in England. The cast of the play met David when he went to see them and met me when I went to see them with David. We went to see the play, then we went backstage to meet them. And later on, we hired them. And when we went back to New York, when I went back to New York with David to sign with RCA, we also arranged a meeting with Andy Warhol and Paul Morrissey. I'd already met and spoken with Andy and Paul before that meeting about Andy's films because I wanted to distribute them in the UK, which proved to be difficult, if not impossible. Um, but in the meantime, <laughs> we did make a visit to the factory. It became a, a famous uh, visit in which Andy and David met and largely ignored each other. And David did a mime that was filmed by another Warhol fan or Warhol studio member who's since died. And I had a long conversation with Andy about how he might improve his future direction as a filmmaker and an artist. And David played Andy his record. Andy left. He'd made a song called Andy Warhol about Andy, but Andy was not really interested in listening to records about himself, so he left. Then he came back and complimented David on David's um, yellow patent leather Mary Janes, which David was wearing at the time. And that was pretty much the last of that conversation. Much later on, David and Andy did get together again. By that time, of course, David was famous, and so... Andy was quite happy to be in the orbit of anyone famous. He wasn't so good at non-famous, actually. Better at famous. But in the meantime, what we inherited from these two New York visits was a small core group of people to begin with, and then a larger expanded group of people, all of whom had ties to 
the gay community, the theatrical community, the artistic community. And what a lot of that did for David was open up his ability to relate to more and more people of more and more different sexual and ethnic groups. In America, especially amongst this group of Americans, especially in cities like New York and L.A., it was okay to be gay. And it was actually a very strong, and gay people were very prominently gay and determined to be heard and seen, and they were much more apparent and much more involved and much more open. Now, this is not true of all of America, but it was certainly true in the East Coast and the West Coast cities, the culture cities. It was less true when you got to the Midwest or even the middle states of America, and certainly not so true in the southern states. But at the same time, the southern states had enormous numbers of people who wanted to or were gay and were simply being suppressed. And many of those people made their way to the other coast. They went to San Francisco, they went to LA, they came to New York. A good example of that is Wayne County, who became Jane County, and who was also part of the Andy Warhol group or crowd, if you like, and was one of the May Man artists. So we did embrace that, and we also embraced straight culture just as easily. Many of our folk in the US and the UK were completely straight, but largely not bothered by the fact that they were also working hand in hand with people who were openly gay or bi, because the excitement of being part of the whole exercise made those considerations relatively unimportant. You could be, as Robin was, happily married and work for us. Same was true for George Underwood, who had a lovely wife called Britt, Mick Rock and his wife Sheila, all perfectly happy heterosexual couples willing to work with us, come on board. So having that addition and division where you have completely gay folk working alongside completely heterosexual folk and getting along and making it work and focused on the one thing, make David famous, was an interesting and certainly ahead of its time exercise. <laughs> In every sense, David, all of the main man folk, half a century ago, did begin a movement towards a cultural, sexual, social, societal revolution that is now being seen in an enormous amount of activity in the arts and in politics. You've got people now in US political positions who are openly gay. This never would have happened if there wasn't a historic um, ability to refocus those attitudes I think we had a lot to do with that. Certainly David was a pivotal figure in making people rethink those kinds of attitudes to society. Tony DeFries describing how 50 years ago David Bowie and the main man team provided a soundtrack and visuals which reshaped the world by complementing a larger fight for acceptance and civil rights in the LGBT plus community that continues today. There are some great pieces of memorabilia from this period in rock history that are part of an ever-growing archive of main man documents that include articles, telexes, letters, photographs and production notes, a lot of them never seen before, that we are adding to the main man label website each week. It's a great record of a very exciting period in rock history. That's mainmanlabel.com. And on the website, you can also check out the other episodes in the Main Man series. In the next episode, we'll delve into the Main Man archives and hear from one of Main Man's most celebrated members, Lee Black Childers. I'm Des Shaw, and this is a Zinc Media MM Tech production. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.